of tourism in this area, the sustainability of these wilderness areas is tied inextricably to the communities on the outskirts here. And mm. There's a lot of good initiatives. So just to reassure you all, uh, from an institutional level, governmental mm. level, all the way down to business owner level at this side, and even individuals, you know, uh, are making a huge difference and a huge impact. Mm. It's just, you know, lack of awareness of these, prod yeah. of these projects is probably our downfall yeah. rather than it not happening. Yeah. You know? And I think one of the really nice uh, examples would be Michael Grover, who's one of who's the general manager of Juma's husband, and he's an ecologist, highly progressive ecologist, and he does a huge amount of work in the communities outside here with cattle grazing. And uh, we've heard us mention quite a lot about how, or certainly me, how the buffalo look pretty good at the moment, but the cattle outside look like they're on their last legs in many respects, and that in many respects is a disaster because much of the wealth that local people have, the meagre wealth that they have, is tied up in livestock. Yep. And there are ways, and Mike's engaging with them in, in trying to manage the rangelands on which those cattle graze more effectively so that the cattle, without reducing their numbers, will survive more sustainably. Yep. So there are definitely projects afoot that are very important. Let's head across to Brent, find out. We definitely heard some lions, maybe he's got an update on them. There was that Inkahuma lioness at the pan moments ago and we're pretty sure she's the one who's got cubs on Juma somewhere and in one of these little river systems. So unfortunately we weren't quick enough to get uh, to the pan before she disappeared but Jamie and I are both in the area circling now uh, and hopefully we are going to find her. And wouldn't it be incredible if we found those literal baby lion cubs? Well, thanks for the update, Morning Glory, who says it was a hippo who chased the lioness off. So sad we lost her. Me too! And I know Veer is as well, and I'm sure Jamie and Brian feel the same. Hopefully we will be able to catch her again shortly. And it's got colder, if you can believe it. Uh, I reckon, especially here where we are, right down next to the, uh, the, the river systems, oh, it must be at least 48, or at most 48, 50, so around 10, 9 degrees. Celsius. But if we can find that lioness, it's all worth the chill. It's definitely got colder. What do you think, Fiam? <laughs> Fiam, it's freezing. So I know James, James has been chatting about some conservation issues this morning uh, and global issues, and one of them is global warning, warming and uh, VM often has some of the best one-liners that ever happen out here and uh, when we got the update from Final Control that James was chatting about global warming, VM's response is well we could use some global warming about now and, and as it gets colder I almost tend to agree with him. Come on, kitty cat. Now, if she didn't get a good drink and that hippo chased her off, she might go back later on, so keep an eye out on that damn cam. Thanks very much, Morning Glory, who says she has faith in us that we will find the lioness. I hope you're right. Now, my hot water bottle's even getting a little bit chilly. 
and it's still lukewarm, I suppose it could be described as. How's your hot water bottle, Vim? Vim <laughs> says he's going to start drinking out of his hot water bottle soon, it's so cold. I must say, I'm a little bit envious of that fire at the moment. Melissa says it seemed like she was calling her cubs and then she left. Uh, Melissa, was she doing a sort of... Mm. Mm. Or was it a... Ow. Ow. So lioness have a couple of different calls. If she was doing a low sort of... Mm. It might have been a contact call for the other adults. But if there was that interspersed with a... Ow. Ow. Then she was definitely calling cubs. So we've suspected she's got her cubs somewhere in this low-lying area ahead of us. And so Jamie's checking closer around the, the water hole. We've done a wider loop and we're going to head back into that area now. There we go, Lucy in South Bend, Indiana, says the lioness didn't even get anything to drink, so it is possible she might try go back there uh, a little later. So our eyes are now peeled. Maybe she didn't move too far. Okay, so this is the little river system. We suspect, we're not sure, that she might be keeping those cubs in. I'm just gonna check carefully that maybe she hasn't moved back up here. Come on, madam. Where are you in Kahuma? Go away bird alarm calling, but they do alarm call at birds as well, but it is the right area. Thanks, a curious one. It says it was not a cub call, it was a contact call, so that 
Now I am going to, I'm going to suffer, but I shall suffer for the chance of a lion. Off with the hot water bottle, off with the leg blankie, and I'm going to try, stand and look down into the river system. So while we hopefully get a chance at finding this lioness, uh, let's go see how the two toasty boys next to the fire are. He really just can't let it go, can he? He's like a dog with a very manky bone, or a hyena with a bone. <laughs> oh, he's so hot by the fire, I'm freezing here, risking my life tracking lions, blah, blah, <laughs> fish paste. Now, our beard, a very nice question from you about what are the best developments that we know of in the Kruger National Park over the last few years that have made a conservation uh, contribution. Steph, you've got an idea. Uh, the, the, the Kruger National Park has sort of remodeled itself recently and, and I think contrary to the general belief of the people that were utilizing the park for their own benefit um, and everyone expected this downfall and collapse when the Kruger National Park reshuffled its management probably around about 1998, 1999, I've only seen good things come of it. Mm. Um, we've had the park start to utilize more of its surface area which of course has created more employment opportunities. It's, it's creating um, new opportunities for business to, or traditional business to be restructured and so more money is going to mm. communities on the outskirts, more focused to specific communities or, or specific projects. Um, and I would just have to say that the, the rest camps have all been renovated, the, 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 the redistribution of positions is mm. now finally in its you know, final yeah. phases and so we're getting uh, people actually moving forward. I, I don't know, I've, mm. this may be a bit controversial with me saying it, but I believe totally that the Kruger National Park is a better place today mm. than what it was 20 years yeah. ago. 25 years ago. Steph, of course, is being very politically correct, and I am inescapably not politically <laughs> correct. And basically, I mean, before 1994, the advent of the democratic era of South, Af South Africa, the Kruger National Park was kind of a bastion of, um, I don't know, it was, it, it was a very white place. It was a pale white place, and it was a bastion for sort of white conservation efforts where there very much was a fences and fortress uh, or f uh, yeah, fences and fortress conservation approach where if you came across the fence you were in big trouble and there was no engagement with the people living outside. And as with all changes in political order throughout the world, uh, any government institution, which is what the South African National Parks is, saw a massive change in management, as yeah. Steph says. And quite apart from the doomsdayers saying that well, you know, these people don't know how to manage land and these people don't have the experience, blah, blah, it's, as Steph says, yeah. the Kruger National Park is a more pleasant place to visit now. There are far more people visiting it of all races in South Africa, which is extremely important. Yeah. And so more and more people, of, more and more South Africans are being exposed to our amazing wildlife heritage, which of course is the whole reason we do what we do. Without people being exposed to the, the uh, wildlife heritage that we have, what on earth reason would they have to help us con conserve it? And why would we want to conserve land and animals if we don't know about them. So that's hugely positive. And I mean, the rest camps in the old days were, yeah. I mean, really, Shiversome. <laughs> shiversomely, <laughs> just poorly designed. And the food, a level that was, uh, well, I mean, just very disgusting. Now you can get a great meal, you can have a clean room. Uh, the rest camps are fantastic, more access for people. And of course, you were mentioning the, the private concessions. So there's, there's seven private concessions in the park and they were, initially uh, thought out to be a 20-year project. So Kruger National Park doesn't do anything in less than 20-year chunks to see what impact it has. Mm. And what they chose was they chose areas in the park that were accessible but very remote areas, undisturbed wilderness, and they basically auctioned off seven of these chunks to conservation businesses or businesses with a, mm. with a footprint in conservation and tourism. Uh, to come up with a strategy to unlock. Obviously, lodges were the key. They have a very little impact, apart from the site that they're on, they have very little impact mm. on, the, on the footprint of the concession. Um, and obviously, generating much marketing for these areas. Um, 
And another thing that they did was they invited uh, at different levels in the in the in the or I, I want to say I, I've forgotten the word not to use, but in this process of of uh, yeah. unlocking this potential, um, for these lodges to come up or these companies to come up with innovative ideas to incorporate the community and incorporate business and see what they can do, and and they're held to that. Um, having been part of one of these concessions before, mm. they do a monthly audit on your promises mm. that you made when you were in the beginning and you held to that on a monthly basis and on a yearly basis that's audited. I just think it's wonderful, you know. A mm. um, lot of money gets pumped back into the communities, yeah. um, which is good. It's what's needed. Uh, Dina, very nice question from you. You say if you come out here and you self-cater, which you can do, absolutely, can you get locally grown produce? The answer is yes to a certain extent, but um, if I was to pick one project other than a people related, well, you were tied in with people here, but certainly if I was to pick one sort of nitpicking real issue that I have, it's the fact that buying starlings flying overhead, buying that you can't buy starlings overhead, buying locally grown produce is very difficult. So, for example, if you buy a, a lettuce somewhere in uh, some of the major centers around here, it's been grown here, it's driven to Johannesburg to the big market every morning, it's been bought there and then driven back again. And so that kind of thing does irk me quite a lot. And yes, you, there are areas you can get locally grown produce, but certainly there could be far greater efforts. And I mean, projects like Mike Grover's doing will kind of get that sort of thing to fruition and it would be great to be able to come to a place and buy only locally grown things, locally grown eggs and chickens it, and meat. And I would say it's very possible. I'd say we're probably guilty of our own, mm. uh, of our own, uh, we, we're remarking quite negatively on the fact mm. that we, we don't grow anything or we don't utilize the majority of our stuff locally. Whereas if you came here and you really wanted to support local communities, you, you could. could trade in the villages quite easily. Yeah, they grow true. a lot of their own food. And if you really wanted to, if we really wanted to, we could... We mm. could actually move into the village and get tomatoes and probably, mm. I don't know, quite a few things. I Chickens? Don't... Chicken, absolutely. Uh, Eggs? Goats. If yeah. you wanted to eat a goat, I suppose <laughs> you could get a goat. Yeah, <laughs> delicious. Mm. Um, uh, and there was something else of vital importance I wanted to say about this. Uh, it, oh, yes. Um, it just, it's fact, it's, it's easier to go into a supermarket, put everything it's into a trolley, and put it in a packet, put it in your car, and then go to wherever you're going. But yes, I think Steph's absolutely correct. You could very easily, without anything in the back of your car, come through this area yeah. between, say, Hootsprate and the Kruger National Park gate, and yeah. if you drove into the villages, and it'd be quite safe to do so, you know, and you had a bit of cash and you asked around, People would point you towards the egg farmer, towards the veggie farmer, towards yeah. the chicken farmer, and you would be able to get locally grown produce. That actually would be quite an interesting exercise yeah. to try and do. Maybe we should do that one day. Uh, Jamie's got an update for you. She's now no doubt basking in the rising sun, taking the coldness of the morning far more on the chin than her erstwhile friend Brent is. Let's get an update from her. <laughs> That's a slight exaggeration. It definitely took the wind out of my sails there because I was about to start talking about how freezing it gets just before the sun comes up. But now I have to take it on the chin because like, James said I did. Yeah, it's cold. It's it, it is very cold. It's really cold. I've been trying to take it on the chin, but I, no. It, it has definitely, there's a strange physics involved in the fact that just before the sunrise, it gets so much colder. And the glint of the morning light is slowly touching the tops of the trees. So I'm thinking along those lines. I know that there's a ridge between here and Mvubu Road, which is where I'm going to go next to look for that lioness. So I'm thinking, you know, we can sort of sit on the crest there, wait for the sun to reach us. It is very cold. It's the kind of, it's the kind of cold that burns your nostrils and your eyes, with the wind chill factor involved as well. That also really doesn't help at all. I think that this lioness might have given us the slip. And it's sad because we have the buffalo to thank for that, in my opinion. I think that they thought about chasing her and she just decided she wasn't going to hang around and have to put up with that. That being said, thank you to Siberia Zumi, who has sent through an update about where they think that she went. 
and that was into the little thicket, not, not over the dam wall, but into the little thicket around there. So we'll go and we'll triple check there, but I'm going to do a big loop first. Her tracks come out of exactly the same spot as they did the other day. So it's almost certain that she's denning in that area. We don't want to push too hard. Obviously, if we were to try and follow her in there, we would potentially scare... Well, we don't know exactly where the den is itself. We will be keeping a close eye on where we go and how we manage that situation. It is a, it is a negative lock. In other words, we can't go tracking in there. Come on, son. We're nearly there, Brian. There's a, I see sun on this road. We're going to go and find it. Yeah. And we'll wait for the male lion to come to us. He must just come to us. My suspicion is, though, that that lioness is going to try and, you know, just speaking of the cold, it's not just us that feel it. My suspicion is that that lioness is going to think about wanting to find some son of her own. Uh, she might not want to be hanging around in the thick drainage line areas when there's sun to warm herself up. She might leave her babies to cuddle up together and go and find warmth of her own. Oh, the noticeable difference as we drive up this road. <laughs> uh, as you can see, the sudden change in temperature has placed us in an almost misty horror movie type style. Uh, Brian's just going to <laughs> give it a wipe. <laughs> sudden changes in... Oh, this is wonderful. Sudden changes in temperature. Oh, okay, we're never moving. We're going to just drive slowly up and down, backwards and forwards. And Brian, on that subject, which animals respond to the early mornings the best, apart from us? There, the, a lot of the crepuscular animals start to move around in the early mornings. Actually, early mornings is best for a lot of the different animal species because it's that perfect in-between between the nocturnal and the diurnal. But things like wild dogs and cheetah are their most active at this time of the day because they know that later it's going to, particularly in summer, but winter as well, they know that later it's going to get very, very hot and uncomfortable for them. So they want to get as much potential hunting done as they can as they go along. I was just stopping to look at old lion tracks there, but it's not our, not our lioness. The, most of the animals are going to start becoming active now. The impala, the buffalo, all of those ruminant animals will be trying to find a nice sunny spot to warm up and to, for now, ruminate. They're not in a rush to start feeding. They are going to be ruminating and just enjoying the fact that they survived the night and the dark and the cold and the predators roaming around. And speaking of the temperature changes, Insomniac, good morning and welcome to our now sunrise safari. He wanted to know if all of the chameleons are gone now that it is colder. They're not gone, they are in a state of estivation, uh, hiding up somewhere in trees or in crevices in the ground and basically slowing their metabolism down. But yes, the chances of seeing a chameleon at this time of year is very, very slim. They are particularly sensitive to cold. They are ectotherms, just as all reptiles are. But they, the last, I did see a chameleon once in midwinter and it was, the poor little thing just couldn't move. It couldn't even change color. It was so cold. Now they do occasionally come out, but it's very seldom that they do. All right, lioness. You appear to have disappeared. It is nice to know that she's still there and I think that pretty much confirms that she has a den site somewhere in that region. We still don't know for with 100% certainty but it seems incredibly likely if she's moving backwards and forwards from that place the whole time. Let's 
do one more loop, check around where Siberia Zumi suggested that she might be. Let's see if we can't get this Daker on camera at the same time. There we go. Don't run, don't run. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. It's one of the antelope species that I wouldn't say we struggle to get on camera, but it definitely we have to work a little bit harder to get them. Most of the time they are dashing away and all you catch is the fleeting glimpse of a disappearing bottom. In this case we've got a female Dacre, very clear by the lack of horns. And if you look carefully as she turns her head, hello girl. Oh, your mohawk's not very straight up, is it? It's a bit floppy. <laughs> there she goes. The Dacre have this incredible sort of thick, sticking up, uh, like, the, like this bobble, but different, sort of straight patch of hair, triangular patch of hair between their ears. Meant to look, meant to look intimidating in some way. I'm not sure if you could see very clearly, but in that morning light, her preorbital glands, the glands close to her eyes, were actually clearly visible as dents in her facial structure. Okay. Bumpy, bumpy, everybody hold on. Morning Glory has said that it's nothing like a search for a lioness first thing in the morning to warm one up and to get the blood pumping in excitement. Oh, that's an absolutely fair point, although I would say conversely, Morning Glory, there's nothing quite like the race towards a sighting <laughs> to add or drop your temperature about five degrees as you speed along. But it certainly gets us really, really excited and interested to try and see if we can't follow up on those animals. I've just heard an update that there are, and there's at least one of the Birmingham boys that crossed through Cheetah Plains last night and is now making his way possibly to the west. So we know where one and two of the Birmingham boys are, but not the rest of them. I'm going to send you back to James and his nice warm fire so that you can warm up there and we're going to continue the looking or the search for this lioness. Now she's also complaining about the fact that we're at a warm fire. Yes, it is warm. Uh, <laughs> Steph's taken his jersey off, as you can see. I'm still sitting in my jersey in solidarity with my mates out in the bush. Um, not that I want to be there with them. <laughs> now, uh, Ravi, another wonderful question from you all the way from New York. You want to know about dung and uh, whether it's used in burning. Well, buffalo dung, no. Uh, cat, uh, elephant dung, no, because elephant dung just makes a lot of smoke, which can smell relatively pleasant, depending on what the elephant's been eating. But cow dung in local areas, people do use sometimes for yeah. fires. I haven't seen it used out here. But Steph says in grasslands that, or in grassland areas, the cattle tend, the dung no, does tend Ma to be used. Ma uh, not the Masai Mara, but the Serengeti definitely. And in desert areas in Namibia, the Heroros. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think they absolutely do use it. I mean, it, it's a common thing in Africa to use, yeah. but I think around the world, dung is used as a cement, a flooring yeah. um, additive, as a cooking, you know, cooking has mm -hmm. been for thousands of years. I remember going to visit a woman's house, well, her whole family's house in probably it must have been around 1986, and she lived on a farm, and they had nothing, these people. They really had nothing. She and her husband, and they had five kids, 
and they lived in the most perfect little situation housewise. It had an amazing view out over the river and it was built, the house was, of mud bricks and dung. It was covered in this cow dung and it gave the place, you can't believe it, how beautiful the smell of this place was and all you wanted to do was sit inside there and breathe in because it just smelt like home for some reason and certainly didn't smell anything like dung does when it comes out of the animal but it really did smell delicious and so absolutely used all over the place. I guess a bit like a peat almost, peat fire. It yeah. doesn't make, won't make a big flamey fire like this one. Not very picturesque, probably quite smoky. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I know that people from the north of Scotland have a, a technique for lighting peat. I believe it's almost impossible, uh, but they do. And I think it's probably much the same with the cattle dung out here. Jamie has got a mammal to show you. I do indeed have a mammal, and in fact, a very alert mammal. Two kudu, a mother and her calf and they're staring intently off into the distance, but not in a panicked way. I think it's more likely that <laughs> that oxpecker suddenly was irritating the little one. Yes, those, those birds are a bit of a pain, aren't they, baby? Are they going to be with you for the rest of your life? Fluttering about, picking away the ticks. I don't think they're alert for any reason other than they've spotted something moving in the distance and it's probably another kudu, just given the way that the longer you sit and watch one kudu, the more kudu you find in the background. I think that's what they were looking at, just trying to make sure that there were no threats coming through towards them. They're such beautiful, graceful creatures. And you can see if you look carefully, you can actually see how puffed up they are in this cold morning air. And like a lot of the other animals, us included, they have been trying to move onto the crests to keep warm. And there you go. What I was saying about if you look for one kudu, others shall appear. Big bull in the back and he is magnificent. I think I've seen him here before. I think he's one of the biggest not in terms necessarily of horn size, but in terms of body structure and stockiness. I think that he might be one of the largest kudu bulls I've seen out here. He's very, very bulky, standing well head and shoulders above the female. It's a nice contrast between the two of them. And then slowly wandering along behind us is the rest of the group of kudu. Coming through a couple of young males, cautiously stepping out. Much, much smaller than that bull that is associated with the female. Oh, look at that oxpecker clinging onto its belly. <laughs> That's amazing. Acrobatics. And here comes the calf. Lots and lots of them about. Oh, I think they were just looking at other kudu. You can just have a look at why in this kind of vegetation having horns can be such a hindrance as opposed to a help. Particularly a, a kudu's horns which are designed more than anything to look intimidating rather than to actually be exceptionally useful. And when they do fight, those horn clashes can be very dramatic, but not really injury un inducing unless they actually manage to get tangled up together. That's purely for reproductive purposes and most of the time just for intimidation purposes. And Joey, I'm glad that you have stuck with us this morning, Joey watching in Australia. He'd like to know how tall that kudu is compared to me. Joey, um, let me think of the easiest way of describing it. So if I am close to 165, um, 165 centimeters, maybe a bit taller, I'm not 
I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly how tall I am. Around five foot seven. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh boy. Aren't you stunning? And his shoulder would come about up to close to my shoulder actually just a little bit lower but just a little bit lower than my shoulder and his horns would be taller than me so right from ground to the top of his horns he would be taller than I am and a great deal heavier Look at that incredible beard slash dewlap. It's absolutely gorgeous. And speaking of his bearded neck, good morning to Liz. Liz, you were wondering whether or not there are any animals that get shaggier once it gets colder. So in kind of like things like bears getting their winter coat or arctic foxes that actually change colour completely, does anything similar happen in the African bush? And the, the antelope's fur might be a little bit thicker, but generally it's not something that they need. They don't need to change their, their, their coat as much as animals in more extreme climates might have to. Actually quite temperate here, and although we've been moaning about the cold, and it is cold, <laughs> really, I mean, it, it never goes very far below zero, except with the wind chill factor, or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So our animals don't really need to grow too much of an extra coat, although I certainly wish that I could, in a way, just have a sort of a, a warm undercoat on. <laughs> it's just no matter how many layers you put on, the cold bites its way through. Now, could you have left? We shall continue onwards and search for the last section of the Sunrise Safari, see if we can't find that lioness for you. Our Daryl, you were wondering, because the kudu does look exceptionally deer-like, you were wondering if a kudu is just like a deer and the answer is no, not really. Uh, they're, they're basically the African equivalent of a deer. They fill a very similar ecological place in the whole setup of the ecosystem. They're a very important food source for the predators. They're a browser of the various tree species. Um, so they and they're a similar size to some of the larger species of deer, something like a red deer for example, or a fallow deer, a bit bigger. The big difference between deer and antelope, or one of the big differences, is the horn versus antler situation. So an antelope has horns, which are solid bone that grow from sort of their first, after their first six months, they start to deposit bone that then grows up in that very distinctive horn structure, whether it's a kudu or a, an impala or a wildebeest, that gets deposited and builds up. Now in our case, about probably about half of the antelope species, the females do actually have horns as well. They will have those for the rest of their lives because it's bone. It's a solid structure that is permanent. Bit of a bumpy road this. Whereas deer, their antlers is actually made from hardened blood vessels. Sorry about that everybody, just trying to get through the, the bumpiest part. That was the road that during the rains the elephants had an absolute wonderful time digging up the mud and throwing it around and they left us with not much of a road <laughs> at the end of it all. So Daryl, yes, the horns are of, an, of a deer are sheddable and made of hardened blood vessels. And speaking of our different antelope. James Richard, you were wondering about the track size of a Dacre versus a Steenbock and you were wondering how similar in size they are. The answer is very, very, very similar in size. A Steenbock track is, they're both very tiny. We're talking about 
possibly less than an inch in length. Now, a Steenbock track is very sharp and almost a, a, like an impala. It's like a little mini impala. Very sharp and with defined edges. A Daker track looks like a perfect symbol of an iron. An iron is in the thing that you iron clothes with. The kind of thing that this, they'd use for the symbol on a, a t-shirt label or something that says do not iron. That's the shape of a Daker track. Very similar in length slightly wider and slightly more heart shaped but tricky there that's a tricky one to tell the difference between all of those the little antelope and when you throw baby impala into the mix you've got an exceptional complication i'm pretty sure that brent was planning on heading back towards where that male lion was calling us so i'm trundling towards galago shortcut but let's find out from him what his plans really are So that male lion called again and has headed to the north. So unfortunately, no luck there. So I haven't quite given up on this lioness yet. Just doing another very slow and careful check to the south of the dam cam. A oh, big group of buffalo bulls there. We'll go have a look at them shortly. I'm just trying to make sure we don't miss her or miss her tracks around here. Now I've got her tracks where she came down towards the pan, but finding tracks of her leaving are proving to be a little bit more difficult. So I'm just listening to the game. Yes, I'm right east From the media, you can see on the east of the block. If you check the There we go. They've just, they've just found that male line almost exactly where I said to Ephraim. If you go to the Buffalo Zook sign and you go east towards Long Pole, that's where he sounded like he was heading. So someone's just found him right there. So he's in Buffalo's Hook. We thought maybe the lioness went towards Inga's house, but no such luck. Well, let's go look at some of these buffalo bulls. So while I was checking for tracks, walking up and down, they were watching me very carefully. Thank you very much, Maggie, in Australia, who says I've been doing so well to let go of my addiction to the word so. Uh, I've only used it nine times in the last couple of segments. And uh, she would like to know whether the cameramen have been oh, a bit nervous, obviously, because there was a lion around here earlier. Hello, big boy. So thanks very much, Maggie. And Maggie was wondering whether they've been using the big stick formula to hit me every time I do it. I think this morning was too cold for any of that. I forgot the stick. And VM forgot the stick, fortunately for me. So these buffalo were sleeping up where those others are in the background. Uh, even when that lioness was here, and in the background you can hear Juma waking up. Everyone is starting their day and we're about to finish ours, or morning at least. It is absolutely gorgeous at this time of the morning. The light is quite spectacular. Let me move forward slightly. Some very pretty light on the doves drinking at the waterhole. Mm. 
No, they took off as we got here, unfortunately. Oh, but there's a green pigeon. Uh, are you okay there, Vim? You got him. Uh, oh, she's right here. Okay, I've got her calling. Right, right here, that lion is. She might be coming back towards the water. Sounds like she's on Mvubu Road. Is there anything behind us, Vim? That was very, very close, that call. Mm. Mm. So we're gonna rush across there. I think she's no more than 100 or so meters away from us. She might not be on the road yet. Maybe she ran into that block. I did see some tracks around there. They weren't the clearest though. Or it could even be another lion. You never know. Opa, over the bump. Very bumpy in this vehicle. Bump, 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 bump. was probably watching VM and I walk around trying to find her. So it sounded like she was just to the northeast of the road around here. Come on, give us a little call. Trying to say, even if some she disturbs some birds. Let's just take a little. Right. This is where it's important to not be too over eager. So, especially in this vehicle, which is very noisy, my ears are going to find this lioness before my 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 eyes. So while well, we're going to sit here quietly and listen, let's go have a look what James and Steph are doing next to the fire. Things have warmed up a bit. As you can see, my face is now bathed in what was golden light and it's now rather blinding, palish, yellow, whitish <laughs> light. And how Steph's managing without the aid of a hat, I'm not really sure. I can see Jamie driving around there. Brent is basically over the back of your head where you happen to be watching the screen. I work that out, yes, that's correct. Uh, he's just to the east of us, into the sun, that is now scorching my eyeballs out of the front of my face. Now, we have a nice question from Sherry about, you say, you, I think you're a little confused about the seasons here. You say there's a dry season and a wet season, so when do people grow anything? Because it's either very wet or it's very dry. Um, Sherry, first of all, our wet season uh, is not really that wet, is it? I mean, the average rainfall in this area is between 450 and 600 millimetres of rain. 600 millimetres is 24 inches, so that's not a huge amount at all. 45, uh, 450 millimetres is 18 inches of rain. So, I mean, we don't, there's not a huge, there's not a huge amount of rain, and that's the growing season. That's when we try and grow crops out here. Any time, sort of, after the first rains, it might be, what well, could be any time from October. Although I know from, uh, from my wife's vegetable garden that um, tropical fruit, she's trying to grow granadillas in our garden. Mm -hmm. And um, they have suggested that we grow it in winter oh. rather than in okay. summer because it's just too hot, you mm -hmm. can't give them enough water. So there's definitely enough sunlight here to mm. do crops year round. Year round yeah. So complementary crops. But yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't know what the guys plant. Um, 
and water is the limiting factor, of course, and so is heat. So many people, if they have water around the place, they will grow vegetable gardens in the winter and not in summer. They'll grow maize in the summertime mm. because the heat doesn't seem to affect them much. But just north of here, on the Lataba River, there are a whole lot of commercial farms. And it's one of the only areas in the country where you can grow crops year round. Yeah. Yeah, all year round you can grow vegetables. So, yeah, if you can get enough water onto your crops, you can grow stuff year round. It's never too wet to plant yeah. anything here. You're never, going to, yeah. Yeah, you're never going to find a rice paddy in <laughs> any of the areas out here. Then I found, well, I didn't really find it. I mean, he's been sat there all day. I tried to bring this um, sort of buffalo skull to bear and unfortunately his horn came off. But it's quite a nice way of having a look here of what a horn looks like. And if you look into the middle of it, Chandra, can you see the middle of it? Yes. This is just the keratin sheath, everybody, of the horn. And inside it is where the bone would have gone. Now, I think this bone has been eaten away, Steph. Oh, huh. definitely looks like because it. Because it's not on the, on the thing there. Now, what would have eaten the bone? It's gnawed on by so many different things. Yeah. I think, yeah, it could be anything. I mean, I would Im even imagine termites to a degree yes. would even eat. It's, I mean, it's quite high in calcium and potassium bone and is obviously yeah. broken down eventually by rain and sun and water. Well, that's quite interesting because in here, I mean, John, if you don't mind, in there again, you can see that slightly discolored grayish soil. And that certainly does look like termite mound to me. And I wonder if this hasn't actually, yeah, the bone's probably been eaten out by mm. termites. It wasn't anything uh, largely carnivorous because, well, they wouldn't have been able to get at it. So I'll just show you where it was attached. John, if you might follow me. You know, I don't want you to strain yourself. I know you've been sat there for many hours now. But it was attached like that. And the bone from the skull actually grows outward like that. And then it's covered in this keratin sheath. And so the termites have probably got in there and they've eaten it out. And what's also interesting, of course, and many of you will know this, are these keratophagous moths. And that's keratin-eating moths. And I'm going to ask Steph to tell you about them because I always get this story a bit mixed up. Are you, you au fait with I can try. I mean, I don't quite know exactly. So the, the, this, is, this, this is a moth. This is, actually, what you're looking at over here is the pupae of the mm. moth's caterpillar just before he became a moth. Uh, so he would have come out of the horn, had enough energy to pupate and turn into a moth, leaving this little cocoon basically, or the leftovers of the cocoon, and then flown off to mm. find another horn. And I think on that note, yes. we can cross over to Jamie who's got some news for you. With a horn. Yeah. We've come through and found a bachelor herd of impala, and I'm trying to show you again, but Rusty refuses to go into reverse, but there we go. Uh, dark, dark in colour, exceptionally fluffed up after the cold morning air and accompanied by the fork-tailed drongos fresh out of bed or at least from roosting in the trees and fluttering about trying to capitalise on breakfast. And when they're all puffed up like this you can really see where Impala get their Afrikaans name, the Rooibok or red buck, because they do take on this incredible rich dark colour, especially when they're all puffed up and cold. Alright guys, over to Brent, he's found our lioness. Success! We've got one of the lionesses here, another one, they haven't found each other, they're looking for each other and this is the calling we've been hearing. So, she's just here. Located uh, to Mufazi Ngala on Mbubu Road, just to the north of the dam. Look at her. So the other one's actually going the opposite direction. And you can see this is one of the ones that's had babies. You can see the suckle marks. So the other one's just gone off towards Gallego, and this one's running in the wrong direction now. Don't go that way. 
Come back this way. Now let's just see if she... She might pick up the scent of the other one that's been going the opposite direction. She's changed direction again. Oh no, don't go east. So the other lioness is heading towards Galago Pan from what I could see, but she disappeared in some thicket. But my channel will call shortly. We're not going to be able to follow her into there. It's very, very thick and steep where she's going. She's still standing or she's moved him? Oh, she's moving. Coming back this way. What they need is a little contact call. Come on guys. Been talkative all morning. Oh look at that. How beautiful is that with the back lights? Absolutely gorgeous. So she's definitely trying to talk with the, the other lioness I just saw disappear. They must have missed each other by 50 meters. Can you see her still, Vim? There she is. Okay, she's running. She's gone into that little thicket, let's see. Just catching movement of her as she dashes through. She might pop out right around here. There we go, she's gonna pop up right next to us. Hello, big girl. Show me looking for your friends, they went the other way. Oh, she's on the move again. Bouncy bounce. Look at her go. So they've just missed each other. The other lioness has gone directly the opposite direction. Very, very, seems very excited to see one of the other members of the Pride. She's probably not seen them for quite a while, while she's had these cubs hidden. Now let's see if she tries a, a contact call. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, look at that white on her face. So, she's heading now towards the dam, cam, or opposite it directly. She might go into the little river system that runs in front of the lodge. So, I think we're going we're gonna to extend a little bit and just stay with her. Uh, I just think it's, it, it could be really fantastic while she's on the move now. 
if we see them meet up. And then now she spotted those buffalo. That's a bit big for her by herself. While we can stick with her, we will. But if she does go into one of these little river systems where it's too thick, uh, we'll leave her. But I think this is, could be a very exciting reunion between the ladies. Might be worth getting Jamie, if she's close by, to head towards Gallego Pan. After you, lady. She is quite hungry. Uh, that fat belly we're seeing there is from uh, her engorged nipples because she has cubs at the moment. Now I'm not sure which is lioness. This could be the one that's got the den side all the way and tortured. Oh, there we go. I think she might have picked up the scent of the other. But it also could be the one we think's got cubs on Juma itself. So I saw two lioness, one just veering off like that, and then this one was running towards us. she's hoping for is to hear the other female call. You can actually hear her breathing quite heavily. She's looking for the scent of the other lioness. Oh, she's heading in the right direction. Oh, was heading in the right direction. Here we go. She's literally on that other lioness's uh, trail now. That's the last place I saw the other lioness was just off through here. Now she's going back in the wrong direction again. Oh, she's heading slightly in a better direction. I'm just going to move around. So the last place I saw the lioness was right here. She was running down the road here. And the other lioness was going into this guar this, these quarries over here. Straight down that big path there. She's just stopped behind that thorn bush. It should pop out in a second. She's on the right trail now. Sniffy, sniff, sniff, sniff. Isn't this light just gorgeous? I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots. Oh, my lens has missed it up a bit. So she is starting to head in the right direction now. So that clickety-click, clickety-click is just me taking a few shots. She's going to come right past the front of the vehicle. Now, that lioness was walking very close to her. If she gets that right scent, she might even start running again. Nose to the ground.
So I think we're going to stay. We go. She's got the sense. She's on the jog again. Now I'm really hoping we're with them when they, they meet up. Uh, it, I think it's going to be quite a spectacular greeting. Unless she loses us in the bush, which is also possible. Hey, my room, do you know if Jackson uh, or Aubrey is out uh, this morning? I don't. Um, Ephraim, I was looking to cross over and head towards Sutton, so that'll be right. Oh so dear, she's taking us over to the, quite a thick uh, little uh, spot, uh, but you know what the, I think uh, I've got a route uh, to get uh, round uh, ahead uh, of her uh, onto uh, the road. But she's on the right trail now. This is where I saw the other lioness disappearing. Watch out for the thorns there, then. Now we've checked this road twice this morning already. And she should come out onto the road. Ah, there she is on the road. Right on the trail of the other less. I think they're going to be drinking okay, at, um, at the Gallego Pan. I'm not sure whether there was more than one. I only saw one though. Okay, but they could, okay. the others could be ahead. Yeah, what's your number? Yeah, I'm still far on my room. I'm not running at that time. Hey, sorry, don't you have to get to the Copy that, my room. So they are they by Big Dam or they're quite north. Okay, so we're about 100 meters away from the Gallego waterhole. And she's definitely in the, as I said, heading in the right direction now. So we're going to stay with her a little bit longer. Yeah, the other line is she might get, let go a low contact core. Oh dear. No, she's off in the wrong direction. So I think it's going to take her a little while to be able to, to find the other, other lioness. But luckily enough they should both be around for the sunset safari so as we watch her disappear in the wrong direction uh, we're going to bid you adieu and thank you for joining us for a really early morning this morning well for us i know it suited some of you guys quite well but we'll see you in a few, couple of hours for the sunset safari <laughs>